Hi everyone, uh, this is going to be a video summary for the concept of first ionization energy. Um, I'm going to apologize up front if the audio quality is a little messy on this. I'm recording this in the lab. The lab is very echoey, um, but it's the quiet space I have at the moment. So, um, first ionization energy is, um, is the first and most important of what we call periodic trends. And we generally look at how do they change across the periodic table? What um, their properties of elements, usually sometimes ions, and they change in these systematic and important ways across the periodic table. Um, the most important ones are ionization energy and atomic radius. We'll also get into ionic radius. I know I'm abbreviating, just it's okay. Um, and um, uh, we may or not deal, may or may not deal with electron affinity. Um, but those are the trends that we're normally talking about when we talk about periodic trends. Um, the key thing for first ionization energy is, um, first off, let's define what is it. So first ionization energy is the amount of energy we need um, to eject an electron from either an atom or an ion. Uh, I guess first ionization energy is technically just from an atom, uh, although I guess you could argue about the first ionization energy. But let's just say or ion for now, not worry about the semantics of it. Someone will write me a nasty comment. That'll be okay. So anyway, um, it's how much energy does it take to kick an electron out? And the reason we studied light prior to this is the way we actually do this in the lab, although we won't do it in our lab, uh, the way you will do it in future labs is you would shine light of different energies. And once you got to an energy that ejected an elect low enough or high enough, you know which way you're going, to eject an electron, um, you'll record that as a signal. And so we can use that to learn something about the atoms, it turns out. Um, the key thing here is that we're going to use properties of the atoms to understand it. So what properties of the atoms are we going to look at? We're going to look at things like the nuclear charge. In other words, how many protons are there in the nucleus? How does that, how, how and why is that important? We're going to look at electron configuration because that's going to tell us something about the distance um, from the nucleus to um, the electrons that we're interested in for that property. All right. Um, but it's also going to have to do with pairing, which is kind of the part of this that everyone dreads but we're gonna deal with that as well in electron configurations. So those are the properties we're gonna look at to explain that. So um, the way that I think it's best to attack these problems is to draw yourself a picture. That's always the case in chemistry. No matter what you're doing, it's always better to draw yourself a picture than sit here and just try to figure it out um, by jumping back and forth between the periodic table and looking it up on Google, all right? So the best thing to do is to make a model. This is the model that I teach in my class. If you are not one of my students and you've just happened across this video, this model is perfectly valid, but if you show it to another instructor or teacher, they're gonna look at you like you're kind of weird because I haven't published this yet and I'm getting around to that. So anyway, so most probable distance models or diagrams, um, what we're gonna do is we're going to imagine graphing the electron distance on the x-axis here, and at zero on that axis is the nucleus. Well, the nucleus for sodium has a plus 11 charge. How did I know that? I went to the periodic table, and I'd really, at this point, moving forward, you just always need to have a periodic table by your side, period, just all the time, but especially when you're working on your chemistry, just always have a periodic table out. I am not gonna jump back and forth to my digital periodic table here. I'm just gonna expect you to have one out. So if you need to pause the video and go grab your periodic table, do it. So anyway, so sodium has a, that number 11 above it tells us that if it's a sodium atom, it's got 11 protons. So the 11 protons have a charge of plus 11, okay? So now we're, gonna, we're going to think about the average or most probable distance from the nucleus to each of the sets of electrons. Well, the 1s electrons are going to be about the same distance on average, probably, from the nucleus um, as one another. So each of the two, we're just gonna stack them on top of each other to note that their most probable distance from the nucleus is about the same. 
But then further out, we're going to run into the 2s electrons. And then just a smidge further, we're going to run into the 2p electrons. And I'm sort of assuming that you know how to do electron configurations at this point. If you don't, please go back and watch that video um, because this is going to be really confusing. All right, and then just a little further out is that last, that 11th electron, that 3s electron. Okay, so this is organizing as a function of distance. Um, what's the average or most probable distance from the nucleus to those electrons? Is this really exactly how it exists in nature? No, because the electrons are these weird particles that can exist anywhere within their orbitals. But um, when you get into later classes, there turns out to be a real calculation for finding the most probable distance. But anyway, so this is not, um, you know, super perfect, but it's a model. It's a way of helping us wrap our brains around it, and it's going to turn out to work. All right, so... How would we do this for magnesium? Well, magnesium, if you look on the periodic table, has a plus 12 nuclear charge because it's got 12 protons. And its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, and then it's 3s2. Okay? All right. So that's the model that I use that I think is most effective for helping students understand and be able to justify... Um, their answer here. By the way, I forgot, back up here under properties, it's not a property of the atom, but you're always going to then combine these together with Coulomb's law. So I forgot to give a shout out to Coulomb's law, which I think is like super important. And if, you know, uh, you haven't cottoned on to this yet, it's the only force that matters in chemistry. So, you know, you got to understand it. All right. So now, down here, I've provided a question, which is a uh, follow-up. Why is magnesium's first ionization energy greater than that of sodium's? Well, let's think about this in terms of Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law says the two things that matter are charge and distance, right? <clears throat> the bigger the charges, the greater the attractive force. The greater the distance, the smaller or weaker the attractive force. However, in this case, you've got a situation where the distance between the nuclei and the outermost electrons, which, by the way, the one that's going to get ejected is always this outermost electron. Um, there's more to it than that, as you're going to see in a minute, but, um, but this is going to work for now. So the distance from each of the nuclei to that last electron that you put in there is roughly speaking the same, because the size of the 3s orbital limits how far away that electron can get. Is That's kind of the major thing limiting how far away it can get from the nucleus, all right? And so now you're just, now we can just kind of ignore all these electrons in between the nucleus and that electron out there, okay? So what we're gonna then pay attention to is the charge. Well, I've got a plus 11 pulling on the charge of an electron is always minus one, right? So I've got a plus 11 drawing on a minus one versus a plus 12 that's attracting a minus one. So which one of those is going to have the greater attractive force? Well, it's going to be the plus 12, right? Because that's the greater charge, and Coulomb's law says the greater the charge, the greater the attractive force. Okay, so that's going to be our explanation. The distance from the nuclei, remember these are the nuclei that we're depicting here, right? So the distance between the nuclei and the outermost electrons for these two atoms is roughly the same because they're both 3s electrons. However, magnesium has a greater charge on its nucleus because it has an additional proton. So it, that greater nuclear charge is what's going to drag that electron uh, more tightly towards the nucleus. It's going to require more energy, therefore, to pull it away. All right? Yes, you have to say all of the things I just said. That's the whole answer. Both parts, charge and distance. Distance, more or less the same because the orbitals are the same. For, the, for these outermost electrons, but the nuclear charge for magnesium is greater, so it requires more energy to pull that electron away. All right? Okay. Cool, cool. So now let's look at one that's a little weirder. So, so this first one was, if you look on the periodic table, sodium and magnesium are adjacent to each other, right? But now let's think about what happens when we compare up and down a column. So why is sodium's first ionization energy greater than potassium's? Well, the reason um, is not clear, right? So if you look at the number of protons, potassium has 19 protons, whereas sodium has 11. So like, what's up with that? So um, shouldn't potassium have the greater ionization energy? But the data says that the sodium is great. 
So we go back to our model. So we say, okay, let's do sodium first. All right, so sodium we've already done, so we don't have to think too hard about it. We're basically just copying this from earlier. All right, 2s, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 2p, 3s1. And then potassium is going to have 19 protons, and it's going to be 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3, 4, 5, 6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s1. All right, so potassium ends in 4s1. All right, so now, well, what, what's going on here? So why, why is sodium the greater ionization energy? All right, so the, the best way to do this is to make a revision to our model. Anytime a model doesn't work, we make a revision. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use something called the effective nuclear charge, all right? And the effective nuclear charge, what we're gonna do, um, and some textbooks will abbreviate this Z sub EFF or Z effective. Z is the charge on a nucleus. Anyway, if you don't like that, that's fine. Really care. I'm going to always call it effective nuclear charge. The effective nuclear charge is going to combine all of the core electrons with the nucleus. Why is that okay? Well, it's okay because these core electrons here are pressing, are repelling that outermost electron, which we've completely ignored up till now. But it's going to matter now because potassium has way more core electrons, right? These are all core has way more core electrons than sodium does. So it turns out that matters, and the best way to deal with it at this stage of the game is to just say, okay, forget it. We're gonna combine them all together, all right? So we're gonna take sodium's plus 11 nucleus and that those core electrons, of which there are 10, and we're gonna combine them together to make an effective nucleus, and I'm gonna draw it over here. So sodium is now plus one effective nucleus, again, positive 11 minus the negative 10 electrons that are in the core, that leaves a 3s electron out here, all right? So for potassium, we're going to take all these, um, we're going to take this co the core electrons and that um, plus 19 nucleus. Well, how many electrons? Well, we've got 18 electrons if you count them up here, okay? So that's going to then translate, what do you know? For potassium, that's going to be a plus one effective nuclear charge with this 4s electron way out here. And now we have this super simple Coulomb's law problem, right? Because, of course, the thing that matters is not the charge now because it's a plus one for both of them and it's a minus one for both the electrons. What matters now is the distance because there's a much shorter distance between the nuclei, the effective nucleus, this pretend effective nucleus, that's our effective nucleus, okay? All right. So that effective nucleus is now going to be um, uh, the, um, the thing that we're going to look at. And we're going to pretend that that's the only thing that's attracting uh, with the outermost electron. And again, I know this sounds hokey, but it really works. So, um, the, um, so the distance is sh shorter between the effective nucleus, or the real nucleus, and the 3s electron than it is in potassium going out to this 4s electron that's much farther away. So of course it takes way more energy according to Coulomb's law to separate the shorter distance 3s electron than it does to separate the much greater distance 4s electron from its nucleus, okay? All right, so um, normally at this stage, I would make you do a practice problem, but I'm gonna actually save that for a second video um, because this video has gotten super long um, so I'm going to cut this off here. There'll be a practice video, so please, please look for that. That'll be ionization energy practice or part two. I don't know what I'm going to call it. But anyway, thanks for watching, and I uh, hope this was helpful. Um, feel free to leave me a comment or get in touch. Thanks, everybody.